Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, the clocks here are not synchronized, so I'm taking an average, and it looks like we can begin. Uh, my name is Lily Liu. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Applied Health Sciences, and be on behalf of the faculty, uh, it's my great honor and pleasure to welcome you all to uh, this evening's Hallman Lecture on the State of Indigenous Health in Canada, Causes and Consequences. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we live, work, and play uh, on uh, this uh, traditional territory of the neutral Anishwabe and uh, Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promise of the Six Nations, and includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. I would like to extend a special welcome to our Hallman lecturer, Dr. Jane Philpott, and special guests, Reverend Dr. Grafton Antone and Dr. Eileen Antone. Thank you for coming. I'd like to also welcome Dr. Jean Becker, Senior Director, Indigenous Initiatives for the University of Waterloo, and our panelists, Dr. Lori Campbell, Director, Waterloo Indigenous Student Center, and also Dr. Rona Hanning, School of Public Health and Health Systems and Applied Health Sciences, also Associate Dean of Grad Studies in our faculty. The School of Public Health and Health Systems at the University of Waterloo is pleased to participate in the Hallman Lecture Series. Through these lectures, we explore the faculty's commitment to excellence by bringing timely and topical learning opportunities to our community. The Hallman Lecture Series is part of a generous legacy left by the university, to the University of Waterloo by Lyle Hallman. Lyle was committed to making a lasting difference in his home community of the Waterloo region. This difference is realized by supporting local organizations with the goal of fostering relationships that lead to resilient, connected, dynamic, and creative communities. The funding of that the University of Waterloo has received from Lyle and his wife, Wendy, has empowered our faculty to make strides towards our vision of protecting and promoting health and well-being for individuals and communities, both locally and across the globe. We're very proud to share a vision with the Hallman Foundation to optimize health prevention and are pleased to acknowledge and show our gratitude to the Hallman family for their leadership and support. I thank Laura Manning, for, uh, who is Executive Director of the Lyle S. Hallman Foundation for this continued support and for joining us this evening. I'd like to express my gratitude to the School of Public Health and Health Systems, particularly the Director of the School, Dr. Craig James, and Administrative Officer, Carol West Seba Beck, for organizing this event today. I sincerely hope you enjoy Dr. Phil Potts' lecture and the following panel discussion. You're invited to stay for some refreshments in the foyer after the lecture and the panel conclude. Introducing Dr. Phil Pott is Ava Hill, former chief of Six Nations of the Grand River, the largest First Nations Reserve in Canada. Born on the Six Nations Reserve, Ava Hill is a Mohawk Wolf clan. She served for 15 years as a member of Six Nations elected council, the last six as chief until November 2019 when she did not seek re-election. Ava has extensive experience working with First Nations and Indigenous organizations locally and nationally. She served as the executive director of the Chiefs of Ontario office the Executive Assistant to the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, and the Executive Assistant to the Co-Chair of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. She has been active on international files, attending the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues for the past few years. She also participated in the Global Preparatory Meeting in Norway, which was a plenary meeting of the United Nations General Assembly, also known as the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples that was held in New York City in 2014. Ava is currently a member of the Indigenous Engagement Council to the Ontario Provincial Police, 
Board of Governors at the University of Waterloo, and a board member of the National Consortium for Indigenous Economic Development with the University of Victoria. Please join me in welcoming Ava Hill. I said, I wonder who she was talking about. Sego, yohaje nayangats. Uh, my name is Ava Hill, and I'm uh, so happy to be here. And, and before I say anything else, I want to thank the student who directed me to the proper location when I got here, because I was lost. <laughs> so wherever you are, there she is up there. Thank you. <laughs> so on behalf of the people of Six Nations and the Board of Governors uh, here at the University of Waterloo, I too want to welcome you to the traditional territory of our people, the Erie, the Neutral, the Huron, the Wyandotte, and the Haudenosaunee. I'll teach Delhi how to say it. <laughs> Thank you, for Deli, uh, Dean Deli Lu, for acknowledging the land that we are gathering on tonight, which, as she said, are Haldeman Treaty lands that were secured to Six Nations of the Grand River by the Haldeman Treaty on October 25, 1784, when we were allies of the British during the Revolutionary, the American Revolution. I would also like to acknowledge that today this territory is home to many people, indigenous people from across Turtle Island, as well as the newcomers who have come to this land many, many years before who we welcomed and who we continue to welcome till this day. We are grateful that they have the opportunity to live here and to share and to help protect Mother Earth. It's my extreme pleasure tonight to be here to welcome the Honorable Jane Philpott, Minister Philpott, you're always going to be the honorable and minister to me. <laughs> <laughs> to welcome her to the University of Waterloo. I first met Jane when she was the uh, Minister of Health and then got to know her better when we worked together on a number of files when she was the Minister of Indigenous Services of Canada. I would like to acknowledge that she has an extensive history in health care uh, over the years, and I know that in, this includes many years that she spent when she was working in West Africa, which I know is still dear to her heart. During our time working together, I came to learn that Minister Philpott's deep commitment for improving the lives of the Indigenous people, not only in healthcare, but in everything that she did as she was a Minister of Indigenous serv Services, but particularly with respect to the children and the young people. When she accepted the role as a special advisor to Anishinaabe Asking Nation, I knew that this only served to demonstrate her, com her commitment and her compassion as she had signed on to help those that needed the most, those that are located in the northern and isolated remote communities. And I commend her for doing that. I'm sure that her expertise, her knowledge, and her com compassion is going to add greatly to the work that she's going to do for Anishinaabe Asking Nation. I also want to congratulate her on her recent appointment. I'm, I'm, Craig is supposed to introduce her, but I want to just add my personal congratulations <laughs> to you for uh, being appointed to the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at Queen's University. <laughs> During her tenure as the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, I know that Minister Philpott took the time to learn as much as she could about Indigenous people and that she undertook her duties with the utmost of compassion and dedication. Whenever I get the chance to speak, I always say that education and awareness is so important, and I encourage everyone to learn more about our Indigenous history and our Indigenous culture, and to understand the pride that we carry as Indigenous people and as Haudenosaunee. We have a rich history and we have a rich culture, and we are always happy to share it. In addition to taking the time to educate herself, I know that Minister Philpott also afforded the same opportunity to the constituents in her riding of Markham when she was the MP for that area. And I know that because I participated in a couple of those events at her request, and I certainly appreciated that and the effort that she was doing to teach her people and to get them to interact with the Indigenous leaders and to learn more about who we are. And perhaps if more people understood what the indigenous people have had to endure for the past hundreds of years, and they took time to learn about what happened to our land, 
how our land was taken from us, how our children were taken from us and put into residential schools, and how we continue to suffer the, the uh, consequences of that with a lot of issues that we are dealing with today. I think if more people took the time to learn about that, maybe it could lead to some of the, eliminate, the elimination of some of the racism and the discrimination that we see in the world today. And perhaps if everyone took the time to learn, they would better understand why there is so much frustration among our people today. We've been seeing it for the last three weeks. The younger people, who are much smarter, and more aggressive than the old leaders like myself, are rising up. And they're smarter and they're more aggressive, as I said. And if the governments of the day do not get involved in meaningful discussions, and come up with solutions that are going to be to the benefit of both of us, this unrest is going to continue and it's going to get worse. I do want to say that the university, because I'm on the Board of Governors, the University of Waterloo is making its efforts with respect to education and awareness of the Indigenous people, culture, and history. The Board of Governors recently approved the university strategic plan for the years from 2020 to 2025. This plan includes the following values. We are curious, we are courageous, we are engaged, and we all belong. One of the impact themes of this strategic plan is strengthening sustainable and diverse communities. This calls for the University of Waterloo to make impact on its campuses and around the world by fostering inclusivity, a sense of belonging, and a culture of involvement. The University of Waterloo recognizes that Indigenous people live and work here. They particularly recognize the Indigenous students, faculty, staff, and alumni, some that are here with us tonight, and are committed to learning about the rich history and culture of the indigenous people of this land to providing and to providing an institutional respond to the calls for action in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This is included in their strategic plan. One of the goals under this impact theme is to promote and support indigenous initiatives and a culture of equity, diversity, and inclusivity for all the objectives to achieving this goal which are to embrace and act upon the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action, to build a stronger relationship with the Indigenous people in the local community, and to improve the representation, participation, and engagement of equity-seeking groups within the community, and to advance programs, policies, and processes that foster equity, diversity, and inclusivity. In their, in their work to achieve these goals and objectives, I have and I will continue to encourage the University and the Board of Governors to work with the Indigenous students here on campus, to work with the faculty and to work with the staff. I want to pay particular attention and acknowledge Lori Campbell at the Student Center and Jean Becker, my good friend, who was recently appointed the Senior Director of the Indigenous Initiative Studies. These are two powerful women. We're all women. Hey. <laughs> Things are going to get done. <laughs> Two powerful women, and I acknowledge the work that they're doing. And Jean is going to be the Indigenous voice. And I've said this at the last Board of Governors. She will be the Indigenous voice as the, the work continues to implement those goals and objectives that are included in the strategic plan. And what I've said at the board meetings uh, more than once is nothing about us without us. I learned that at the UN. So. It's far-reaching, nothing about us without us. When we're included, then we will be feel things will get done to the way that we want to see them done. I also want to encourage everybody here and the faculty and the staff to acknowledge those Indigenous students and to visit the Indigenous Student Center, which is located at St. Paul's University. Lori is over there. I've been over there many times. They have good soup and bannock days. And encourage you to go there and to also take part in many of the events that they organize throughout the year. This will be part of your education and awareness, and they're very friendly and they make good soup. <laughs> so lastly, I want to thank you. As I said, it's my pleasure to be here tonight with all of you and to uh, welcome Jane, Minister Philpott, 
I, look, I, along with you, look forward to hearing her perspective on the state of health in Indigenous communities, which is based on her experience, her expertise, her compassion, her knowledge, and her own personal hands-on experience. Thank you very much, Nyawa, and I look forward to hearing your words, Jane. No, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ava. Um, and uh, really a, a wonderful and heartfelt introduction of, uh, of Dr. Philpott, one that I can't possibly, <laughs> uh, I can't speak with the same personal experience that, that you have. And it was wonderful to hear those words. My name is Craig Janes. Um, I'm uh, director of the School of Public Health here at the University of Waterloo. And I welcome all of you. And thank you for coming out on this uh, rather miserable uh, evening. And uh, I, I know that, like, uh, like you, I'm looking forward to, uh, to hearing uh, Dr. Philpott speak. I won't say much by way of introduction, because I think uh, um, Ava has done a really wonderful job in doing that. Just to simply say that um, it seems to me that Certainly, I, from my experience just today, uh, hearing Dr. Philpott speak to our students and so forth, uh, she's clearly an inspiring uh, leader, uh, one with a great deal of integrity, uh, and uh, one that um, I think that certainly many of us uh, would very much like all of our leaders uh, to emulate. So without further ado, uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Philpott to give the Hallman Lecture. Thank you very much for the warm welcome and good evening, everyone. I'm honored that you uh, have found your way here through the winds and snow uh, to come out tonight to talk about a very important topic. And I want to thank uh, the university for uh, welcoming me here so warmly, particularly to Dean Liu for her lovely uh, engaged welcome. We, uh, we had a, a really nice time together this afternoon. I'm going to learn from uh, the dean who is uh, taking uh, this faculty in such a strong direction. And um, Ava, if you're going to keep calling me minister, I'm going to keep calling you chief. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank Chief Hill for, uh, for her lovely um, acknowledgement of the territory and uh, her uh, welcome and introduction here this evening. And um, I want to just say thank you to our elders who are here tonight, to Eileen and Grafton. Thank you for, for blessing us with your presence. Uh, to Dr. Janes for organizing the lecture. Dr. Hammond also invited me to be with some of his students this afternoon. And of course, to the Hallman Foundation for, for sponsoring the evening. Uh, I uh, recognize that there are a lot of people who have expertise on these issues tonight, so hopefully I'll be able to share something uh, that will keep you thinking about these incredibly important issues, and uh, let's just launch right into things. I like to often dedicate uh, my talk as I'm preparing it to someone who um, I'm thinking about as I'm preparing my talk. And tonight I want to dedicate this talk to a woman who I will call Allison. It's not her real name, uh, but uh, I will call her that for now. I attended Allison's funeral two weeks ago. I actually never met her, but she is a, was a young woman who died at the tender age of 34 of complications of diabetes. I had traveled uh, with some of my colleagues from Anishinaabe Aski Nation to the community of Sandy Lake, First Nation in Northern Ontario. And our purpose for going there was to meet with the chief and council and to talk to them about health transformation. We never ended up having that meeting because as we were going up there, we were told there were two deaths in the community and that the community was completely preoccupied by dealing with the death of an elder, which was not unexpected, but, all, but also dealing with this young woman, a mother of two. She died of diabetes in a community that has purportedly, according to some, the highest rates of diabetes in the world. She had had diabetes for many years, had had an amputation of her leg in November, never ever got out of hospital in Sioux Lookout, and was brought back to her community after she had passed. If that woman, Allison, was white, I don't believe she would have died. I believe she would have been able to live a long life, 
taking care of her two children, and contributing to her community. And it's because of people like Allison that we need to have this conversation tonight. So that 34-year-old women in the, one of the richest countries in the world will not die an unnecessary premature death. The other thing that I want to say, just to set things in context tonight, is to talk a little bit about who Canada is and what we're dealing with. And this is a time of a lot of reflection for us as a nation. Who are we as a nation? What are the challenges that we need to face together? And I believe that one of the documents that I would strongly encourage you to read portions of was written 24 years ago and has stood collecting dust on the shelves of all sorts of officials across the country. But if you have not ever read it, please have a look at the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. Now, I have to warn you that it's 5,000 pages long in four volumes. And I don't think most of you will have time to read 5,000 pages. But Google highlights of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, and you'll find a document that's about 70 pages long. And it starts with this passage that says that Canada is a test case for a grand notion. The notion that dissimilar peoples actually can share land, resources, power, and dreams, all the while respecting and sustaining their differences. But you know, Canada is the story of many such peoples trying and failing, but always trying again to live together in peace and harmony. That notion of Canada is being tested seriously right now as we speak, and we need to figure out how we are going to share land, resources, power, and dreams. Health is perhaps the area in which the challenges that we're facing become most obvious to us. And I don't expect you to be able to read the details of these slides. But increasingly in Canada, fortunately, the media, in part in response to the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, are starting to pay more attention to the state of health of Canada's Indigenous peoples. I have to give a small shout out to the CBC that has uh, a, an, an entire department now uh, that is addressing specifically Indigenous issues. Uh, it doesn't always rise to the top of their stories, but they are spending more time. And the same topics keep coming up over and over again. The forced sterilization of Indigenous women, the high rates of suicide among youth in Indigenous communities, the continued serious systemic racism that takes place in our healthcare institutions, and the ongoing tragedy of completely preventable and treatable infectious diseases such as tuberculosis that cause the premature death of young people in Indigenous communities in this country. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And we're going to specifically look at one of the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I don't know whether you have a favorite call to action. This is mine. I don't know whether it's even right to call it a favorite. But to me, this is the essence of what I believe that I need to be part of responding to. Call to Action 18 is one of a number of, of calls to action that have to do specifically with health. It's one of the foremost themes of the TRC calls to action. And this is an important one that calls upon all governments of our country, federal, provincial, territorial, and Aboriginal governments, to acknowledge two things. One is that the current state of Aboriginal health in Canada is not unexpected. In fact, we know why it is there. It is a result of previous Canadian government policies, and I would argue previous and current Canadian government policies, including residential schools. And the second thing that we're asked to do is to recognize and implement the health care rights of Aboriginal people. Those health care rights are laid down and made clear to us in international law, in our constitution, and under the treaties. So the road to addressing this is clear. And the consequences are also clear. And this is where I think Canadians are waking up. And if nothing else has happened in the last couple of weeks, it's becoming clear to Canadians that we can't continue to ignore 1.7 million people in our population who have suffered serious injustices, and that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, as Martin Luther King said. 
We will never be whole and healthy as a country, as a society, as a nation, unless we address the serious injustices that take place within our communities. Ill health anywhere is a threat to wellness everywhere. So let's talk a little bit about just some of the realities of what that looks like. And I'm not going to give you a whole lot of data in terms of what's actually happening and the state of health of Indigenous peoples. We're going to spend more time talking about causes and consequences. But let me just give you a little bit of a snapshot of some of the things that Canadians need to recognize. I expect most people that are here in this room know that Indigenous peoples are not a homogeneous group. There are 1.7 million approximately Indigenous peoples in this country. They are uh, all individuals. And those individuals are gathered in collectives. And within those collectives, there are large groups, such as the Inuit, the Métis, and multiple First Nations, some of whom have their traditional territory here in the Waterloo region. The Inuit are one of the smaller groups uh, who have their land largely across the north of Canada in an area called Inuit Nunangat for land claim organizations that are uh, governing those regions. They have some of the worst health outcomes in the country. The life expectancy for Inuit is more than 10, time, 10 years less than it is for non-Indigenous Canadians. This is uh, relatively recent data that shows as well that infant mortality rates continue to be about three times higher. Infant mortality is the number of children that die before they reach their first birthday. And still, 12, over 12 out of every 1,000 Inuit babies that are born will not reach their, their first birthday. But perhaps one of the most shocking of all is the rates of tuberculosis. And if you ask most people on the streets of Waterloo whether we have a tuberculosis problem in Canada, most of them would say, of course we don't. Tuberculosis has been gone long ago. It's, it's, it's uh, preventable, it's treatable, even though there are, of course, some drug-resistant forms of tuberculosis. But in Canada, amongst Inuit, the rates of tuberculosis are over 300 times the rates that they are amongst the Canadian-born non-Indigenous population. And I hear stories regularly of young people, teenagers, who have had symptoms of tuberculosis for up to two years, completely undiagnosed, who die in our hospitals here in this country, including one of them, Gussie, who was featured on one of those news articles there just a few pages back. Most of the, to the topics I'm going to talk about tonight, some of the data, will come from uh, an area of the country that I've been working in in the last number of months specifically. And I do this in part because you can't actually capture uh, the, the breadth and the variations of data uh, that are so significant across the country, but also because I think that the people of Anishinaabe Aski Nation, as Ava has so uh, readily recognized, are people that suffer some of the most serious health outcome challenges in the country. Anishinaabe Aski Nation is actually a political advocacy body that represents 49 First Nations communities, 49 Indian Act bands that uh, take up much of the, the most uh, remote northern parts of the country. This actually is an area that's the size of France. It has one hospital, one hospital that is falling apart, has been in need of repair for a very long period of time, and most of the community actually is being uh, served by nursing stations that were designed a very long time ago and are unfortunately quite inadequate to be able to address the health needs. And so I'm going to look, share with you a little bit of the data that has come out of some of the work that's being done by the Sioux Lookout First Nations Health Authority. The Sioux Lookout First Nations Health Authority, otherwise uh, commonly known as SLIFNA, um, actually looked at their data of their both children's and adults' health outcomes in 31 of the 49 communities. And in these 31 communities, uh, 25 of them are only served by emergency air. If there's an emergency in the community, the only way to get people out of those communities is by sending in air services. It's a very young population. About 40% of the population is actually under the age of 20. And this is some of the work that, that SLIFNA has done in recent years. And one of the things that they discovered in their data as of August of last year was that the prevalence of diabetes in the under 20 population is 24%. 
One in four people has diabetes. And this is not the kind of diabetes that some of you in the room have where you're, you're pre-diabetic, you take a bit of metformin, you go on a diet, you, you have, have, uh, have early diabetes. This is a very advanced diabetes that includes serious complications, including uh, complete renal failure, amputations, etc. cetera. Uh, what uh, underlies this data is the fact that there's actually quite a bit of diversity across these communities. The lowest incidence of any of the 31 communities was 16%, and some were as high as 39% of the communities suffering from diabetes. If you look at other types of data, you'll see again what I talked about, the early death that's happening. People not actually reaching what we call the age of retirement. Now, I think there's a lot of you that are here, here that are over 65. I don't know whether you consider yourself retirement age or not. Some of us, I'm not sure if we'll ever retire, but 64% but of all deaths occur before the age of 65. So that 64% of people wouldn't live long enough to be able to enjoy retirement. That's compared to 22% in the rest of the population. And some of those deaths are in very young people. One of the other pieces that I'll share from that particular study that just came out was the rate of, of death from injuries, more than five times the provincial average. Now, some of this is, of course, uh, intentional. About 30% of those deaths are intentional and include suicide, deaths by suicide. But about 70% of those are unintentional deaths related to a whole range of things, including uh, serious infrastructure gaps uh, that cause uh, falls, things like winter roads that are not properly cared for, and people having accidental deaths as a result of that. Thankfully, I'm happy to say that these communities, with some support from government, but in many places because they have actually finally decided to take their future into their own hands, have, have been increasingly looking at how they can change the healthcare system so that it serves them better. And there's a tremendous amount of community engagement that's going on across Anishinaabeaski Nation, as is the case with many uh, collective organizations across the country um, modeled after some really good work that's being done, for example, in British Columbia with the British Columbia First Nations Health Authority. And so some of the other perspectives that I wanted to share with you were from a community engagement session that took a place just last week. This is hot off the press data. Uh, but the first, Anishinaabe Aski Nation has decided to engage in a process of health transformation, essentially decolonizing the health system that serves their people and asking the people what they expect out of their health care system. These are the kinds of impressive pieces of, of documentation that they have put together as people have come together saying, what is the health care system, not that is imposed on us, but what is a health care system that will actually work for us? And it's some very, very exciting work uh, that's taking place in these communities that, uh, that doesn't ever grab the headlines, but it's, uh, it's absolutely impressive. And the people gather together, young people, elders, community leaders, women, and talk about what matters to them. And what matters to them is things like this, things that I talked about, the fact that people go out of our community, they get evacuated by air in the air ambulance, and then they come back in a coffin. And it happens over and over again. Death is like a stream that flows like the river. And what they say is that they have solutions. And one of the common solutions that Ava and others will tell you has to do with the land. We need our land back. We need access to our traditional territories because we need that to heal. And we talked about this this afternoon in the session with the students where we were talking, one of your professors was asking about mental health, mental wellness, and what is it going to take for people to heal? It's going to take land. Sure, it might take the odd antidepressant and the odd psychiatrist here and there, but you get a lot further with the land. We need access to our traditional territories to heal. We need the plants and the medicine. Now we are in reserves that are like little boxes. We need a whole paradigm shift. And that's, in fact, what's happening. Technology has failed. 
Some of the people at that community engagement session said things that I used to hear when I worked in West Africa 30 years ago. We have an x-ray machine, but the x-ray machine has been broken for years. We had to train our janitor to be the x-ray technician, but that's not working for us anymore. These are not quotes that came from 30 years ago. These are quotes from last week. Last week at a community engagement session in Thunder Bay, people are still talking about the machines that don't work and the lack of anybody in the community that can either fix it or operate it. And so they're talking about what will it take to build, rebuild a health system. Well, it'll take a lot better infrastructure for one thing. This is one of the realities that struck me very recently as the people of uh, Sioux Lookout region and the Anishinaabe Asking Nation have been talking about their needs and their desire to build a hospital for the Northwest, a hospital that looks unlike any other hospital in the country. But when we started to look at, well, how big of a community do you have to be to have a hospital? And they, we noticed that, in fact, if you are a community largely of white people, is everybody okay there? All good? I have a habit of being in audiences where people collapse. <laughs> and then I usually have to rush off the stage and do CPR. No. Um, <laughs> if you're in a place like Geraldton, Atacokan, Marathon, Red Lake, if you have two or three or 4,000 people, you have a full-blown hospital, a provincially funded hospital with hospital beds where people can stay overnight and emergency services that operate 24 hours a day. But if you live in Sandy Lake or Pekanchikum or Ibamatung, if you have a community of two or three or 4,000 people, you don't have a hospital. You have an aging nursing station that's cared for by a long stream of nurses that come and go and don't know your culture and don't know your language. And if you need to stay in a hospital overnight, you have to leave your home community. So what are the consequences of all this? Well, as I said earlier, it doesn't just affect Indigenous peoples. It affects us all. And in that same Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples that I spoke about earlier, it makes the point that the cost of maintaining Aboriginal people in this state of dependence and social disorganization measured in human distress, lost pro productivity, and the continual proliferation of government programs is enormous. The cost is enormous not just to Indigenous peoples, but to the whole country. And it's long past time that we acknowledge that. The solutions are there. The solutions are not far away. The solutions come from listening a lot of listening, and then a lot of empowering. And we're going to talk about what that looks like now. I know that you have a lot of health uh, experts in the room who study what it takes for people to be healthy. When I went to medical school, nobody talked about the social determinants of health. We learned a lot of things about chemistry and biology and physiology and pharmacology, but we didn't learn about housing. We didn't learn about the importance of having a job. We didn't learn that culture has anything to do with health. Thankfully, we've come a long way, and so we've learned a lot about the social determinants of health. And this is just a, a, a snapshot of a few of the social determinants of health. This is pretty much mainstream understanding now across the country that you can't actually help people be healthy unless you address the social determinants. So that's part of the solution. And there, I'm happy to report that there is actually a lot happening on addressing social determinants of health. Uh, for and with Indigenous peoples. Ava referred to some of this earlier in terms of the work that's being done on addressing early childhood uh, effects. And if you look at the TRC recommendation, it is not an accident that the first five calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission have to do with child welfare. And the fact that the legacy of residential schools has, in fact, only continued through the overapprehension of Indigenous children. I was stunned when I was the Minister of Indigenous Services, and one of the first meetings that I went to was the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs in Winnipeg. And I started to hear what was going on in Winnipeg in, in this day and age, is that every single day in the city of Winnipeg, someone walks into the hospital room of a woman who has just given birth 
who is indigenous, and they take that baby from her. They take the baby from her most often because she's too poor or because her house is inadequate or because she suffers from health problems. And somehow our system has suggested that it's better for us to take that baby away to pay a non-Indigenous family an exorbitant amount of money rather than to actually support the family to be able to take care of that child themselves. Thankfully, there is progress being made. Many of us have been raising the alarm bells, many long before I was raising alarm bells, but I'm happy that I got to draw some attention to this during my time as minister. We were able to actually put through a bill which recognizes uh, and supports doesn't give rights, those rights are already there for Indigenous peoples, but this bill recognizes and calls for the implementation of Indigenous rights to raise their own children. And I'm happy to say that Manitoba just a few weeks ago has announced that they have cancelled their program called Birth Alerts, which was the program that enabled uh, child welfare agencies to go in and apprehend children, sometimes without even warning the mother in advance that it would happen. There is work being done on housing across the country. We will never be able to eliminate tuberculosis amongst Inuit until we address the severe overcrowding that takes place in Indigenous communities across the country, most severely in the far north. And this is a housing unit, a quadplex that uh, is from the community of Nain, an absolutely stunning community in Labrador. Uh, that are working on building houses, and there's, there's a tremendous amount of work being done on that. And I could talk to you all day about housing, but I won't get into that. I wanted to just point to one other social determinant of health that I think is really, really important, and that's culture as a social determinant of health. This is something that I, has come to me over and over again, and I still think it hasn't sunk so deeply into me to realize that people can't be healthy uh, physically, emotionally, spiritually, unless they know who they are. Uh, most of us grew up knowing who we are, understanding our culture, and if we take culture away from individuals, it's almost impossible to be healthy. This is a man that I learned a lot from. His name is Edmund Matatawaban. If you have a chance to order his book, uh, it's called Up Ghost River. Edmund Matatawaban was one of many people who suffered at the hands of St. Anne's Residential School, including being uh, administered shock treatment in the electric chair that, took, that, uh, that had a place in St. Saint Anne, Saint Anne's Residential School in Fort Albany. Uh, and he thankfully uh, ha survived that and, and has written about it. Edmund lives in this community of Fort Albany, and this is his house. It's the nicest house on reserve I've seen anywhere in the country, I think. Well, maybe there's some nice ones in Six Nations. But what I loved about this house in Fort Albany is that you drive past all sorts of these homes that have boarded up windows that are ugly boxes that are there because they meet the standards of the Indian Act um, rules and regulations. And then I drove, we drove to an end, the end of a, a laneway hidden off in the bushes, this log cabin. And in the center of the log cabin is a beautiful fire. And all around, this is the kitchen part of it, but all the other walls were lined with books. And I said, Edmund, this is the most beautiful house I've ever seen. And he said, I built it with my own hands. I broke all the rules. This is completely against all of the Indian Act legislation. But we wanted to build a house like my grandparents had. Uh, and it is the loveliest house I've been in, certainly in Fort Albany, uh, and reminded me again of the importance of culture. But colonialism, you know, is the most uh, critical and uh, the, the social determinant of health that actually feeds into all the other social determinants of health. It's a distal determinant of health. And it is colonialism that has led to the real challenges that we have put in place around housing and education, early childhood experiences, and the lack of culture. And we will not actually address uh, health unless we address colonialism. But it's actually deeper than that. And I've lost track of all the notes of the things that I was going to say, but clearly I haven't had trouble thinking of something. But <laughs> uh, where am I here? I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, the decades of laws and policies that have left these communities with their crumbling in infrastructure and their lack of, of, of basic health needs. So much of health issues has essentially uh, been 
acts of omission as well as commission. And when I was Minister of Health, it stunned me to look at what was on the books of Health Canada and the First Nations Inuit Health Branch around policies on Indigenous health. And as you start to dig, there actually isn't much there. There is this document from 1979, which I discovered was the basis on which the First Nations Inuit Health Branch was established. And this mandate that was given to the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch, and if you look closely, it was the Honorable David Crombie who released this document in 1979. And he announced it not with a signing ceremony, not with any consultation with Indigenous peoples, but simply a fax that was sent to what was then called the Indian Brotherhood to say, this is the policy. Here's how things are going to get done. And it actually hasn't been updated since 1979. So, a lot of work that needs to happen. But, you know, social determinants of health are actually not the root of the problem. The roots go deeper. And this is one of the things that I have come to understand in the last few years and probably still don't understand to its fullest extent. But, in fact, it goes deeper than that and it goes to rights, particularly the right to self-determination. Again, we knew all this 24 years ago when the Royal Commission talked about it saying that Indigenous people don't want our pity. They don't want our handouts. They want recognition that these problems, here we go again, look at this, are largely the result of the loss of land and resources, the destruction of economies and social institutions, the denial of nationhood. And what Indigenous people seek is a range of remedies, but most of all, they seek control over their own lives. And most of us in the room have not had the experience of losing control, but taking away people's control over their own lives is about the most serious thing that you can do to a person's health and to a community's health. And so let's go back again to that call to action and see what it is that we're supposed to do. And I want to break it down again and make sure that you've got the two bits of it that, that this call to action asks us to do. It asks the governments of the country and I think if the governments are going to do it, then the people should do it as well, to do two things. One is to recognize that the current state of health is a direct result of what? Government policies, including policies of residential schools. And I think the commissioners could have gone on and listed a whole bunch of others, but that is probably one of the most serious policies. But the most important thing that I like about this is that it actually gives us the remedy. The remedy is right there. Recognize and implement health care rights. What are those rights? Well, it doesn't actually talk about it here, but of course many of those rights are inherent rights, they're human rights, uh, and Indigenous peoples uh, need to have their inherent rights respected. But there are also rights that are clearly laid down in international law, in constitutional law, and in treaties. And so here's how I have come to understand how we're going to actually make progress. It's kind of like an iceberg I discovered. And, you know, when I was Minister of Health, there were so many, and Minister of Indigenous Services, so many tragedies took place, uh, particularly tragedies when there would be a whole spate of suicides that would take place in Indigenous communities. And the media come rushing up and want to talk to all the ministers and get the answers. How many emergency mental health workers are you sending to the community? Well, we'd give them their answer of how many emergency mental health workers they were doing and, and how many psychiatrists are going to be there and what, what hospitals are these people going to go to and how are we going to deal with the immediate health care needs. That's all the piece above the water. And nobody starts to think what actually has to happen underneath all of that. So yes, of course, we need good hospitals, we need psychiatrists, we need mental health workers, we need the the healthcare pieces, but we need to actually get deeper than that. And I didn't, couldn't figure out how to make my, these things go onto my iceberg, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the better healthcare is really important. That's the piece above the water. But people's health will not improve, and this isn't just about Indigenous peoples, but it's peoples in general, unless you address the things that are deeper in the iceberg. And one of them as is commonly understood now as social determinants of health. I don't think anybody can graduate from a university in this country without understanding that people will not be healthy unless we address social determinants and they can hopefully list what all those are. 
But the piece that is not so widely understood is the recognition of rights. And when it comes to Indigenous peoples, without the recognition of rights, without recognizing uh, the corollary to that, the damage that is done by the denial of rights, by the domination and assimilation of Indigenous peoples, uh, we will not actually be able to make progress. So recognition of rights is, a, as I say, a timely topic. And it's absolutely critical that that happen in order that we address these health outcome gaps. Because the health outcome gaps have their roots in laws, policies, and practice of our country, including the things that the TRC talked about, like residential schools, but so many other things, like forced mass resettlement that has taken place and continues to some extent to take place, and intentional cultural oppression. So let's talk about a few of the positive things that are happening around recognition of rights. Recognition of rights are, are well documented in a whole number of, of documents, and one of the most important of which is self-determination. And I'm happy to say that in spite of all of the challenges that we continue to face in the country, there are signs of progress in this area. This is one of the happiest moments of my entire time in Cabinet when I sat alongside chiefs in Masquachis, which is in Treaty 6 in Alberta, and uh, signed over the education system to the four communities, four Indian Act bands that make up Masquachis, uh, who have decided to take over their education system entirely. And as Grand Chief Willie Littlechild said, if there are problems in the future, there are problems, and we're glad to have them, uh, instead of being always uh, looking to the federal government. Uh, the, the rights that are laid down in the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People are critical to the future of health care. And thankfully, we have had, because of the slowness of government, we have had other bodies that have actually picked up on advancing the rights of Indigenous peoples in very effective ways. And I want to give a shout out to, uh, in particular, the work that has taken place through uh, groups that have taken advantage of the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal uh, to be able to put forward some of the work that has to happen. In particular, if you're not aware of it, there's some really important work that's happened under something called Jordan's Principle. Um, anybody, how many have heard of Jordan's Principle? Quite a few of you. Fantastic. That's great. Uh, so a big shout out to Cindy Blackstock and many others who brought this case to the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. The Jordan's Principle was passed in the House of Commons in 2007. It's named after Jordan River Anderson, who is a boy from um, Norway House Cree Nation who died at the age of five, having spent his entire life in hospital in Winnipeg because there was a fight between the federal government and the provincial government as to whose responsibility it was to pay for his care. Jordan was born with a number of, of health issues. His family wanted to take him home to his community, and nobody could agree as to who was going to pay for it. He never went home and died in hospital. And so uh, in 2007, a, a motion was passed in the House of Commons saying nobody should die uh, because governments are fighting with each other over whose responsibility it is. They should make sure that the child gets the care and figure out who pays for it later. Well, that was all well and good, but there was never any money attached to Jordan's principle. And basically, there were, there were zero cases that could be pointed to when uh, we started working, when I started working in government in 2015, there were zero cases where we could say this person got care because of Jordan's principle, because we actually enacted that principle and said we're going to get that child care and figure out who pays for it later. So one of the things that I'm most proud of that happened during the last government uh, was that we actually put some money where our mouths were um, and put some funding behind Jordan's principle. And for those of you who uh, work in Indigenous communities, you will know that has actually made a huge difference in the lives of all sorts of, of children, uh, because the, uh, both because of the government funding and also because of the very, very clear, strict direction 
of the, uh, of the quasi statutory authority of the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, basically the government can't say no, which is really awesome. And everywhere I go when I work with Indigenous peoples, I say, just remember, they can't say no to you. If you have a child who needs care, they can't say, oh, it's the pro province's problem, and the province can't say it's the Fed's problem. Um, they, there is an obligation now to be able to actually make sure that those children get care, uh, and it's fantastic. And as I said, one of the other really positive things that's happening is this whole movement of health transformation. This is a picture that was taken two days ago uh, in Toronto that I met with a group of people who were actually the Chief's Council on Health Transformation for Anishinaabe Aski Nation uh, that were working forward on this incredible plan of rebuilding a health system that is designed by First Nations for First Nations. And it's absolutely extraordinary, as this is starting to happen in, in pockets across the country, where people are deciding for themselves what that healthcare system should look like, and uh, recognizing uh, the, the needs that go other governments can help with but uh, essentially supporting self-determination. One of the really great examples of that uh, that's actually funded by Jordan's Principle is something called Choose Life. And um, this is a really, again, out of tragedy comes, comes good news if sometimes. Um, there was a, a spate of suicides that took place in a little uh, community called Wapakika uh, in 2016. And these communities were beside themselves, and the chiefs and elders were beside themselves, saying, "What are we going to be? What are we going to do?" These are ten-year-old girls, eleven-year-old girls, uh, deciding that life isn't worth living anymore. How are we going to actually be able to um, prevent the, this high rate of suicides? And remarkably, some smart person, probably one of the elders, said, "Let's ask the young people what they want." Uh, and so we did. And we found a way, the government found a way to fund it using Jordan's principal money. And the youth of these communities came together and designed a program called Choose Life. Now, some people don't like the name because they think it has <laughs> something to do with reproductive rights. It doesn't. This is, about, this is about young people who said, you know what we want most of all? We want to know who we are. We want time with our elders. We want to learn our language. We want to learn to hunt and fish. We want to be able to better understand our ways and our people and our history. And it's not extraordinarily expensive, but across all of Anishinaabe Aski Nation communities now, young people are running programs called Choose Life and encouraging one another to do just that. And Choose Life programs are now popping up in Saskatchewan, uh, in Manitoba and uh, in Treaty 8 of Alberta, where young people are, are deciding that they want to heal through culture, through language, through land, through lineage, uh, knowing who they are. So there's a lot of work for us to do, and I'm going to, I think, wrap it up now so that we can have time for our panel and hearing from the other women who are here that are better experts than I on these issues. But I wanted to just leave you, and this is a, a more detailed slide than others, and I will happily um, ask Carol or anybody else to, to feel free to share slides and details. This actually comes from an international consensus statement that I wanted to just put up, not so that you look necessarily at the details, but to think of the fact that we have institutional obligations. Government has obligations, people, individual people have obligations, but our institutions, including our universities, have very serious obligations to address these issues. And so here are some of the recommendations of this international consensus statement that I wanted to just put up there, because I know that your university uh, does understand this, but we need to hold them to account uh, in this regard to make sure that universities truly understand the extent to which colonization is a determinant of health, to understand the extent to which they must have explicit, rigorously developed uh, curricula that are associated with this, these issues, and that they must invest in the infrastructure and leadership and resources necessary to build capacity within Indigenous communities. The last thing I will say um, is, again, you can tell I wrote my talk mostly this week because these are all really contemporary <laughs> things. So. 
Shame on me for not being organized ahead of time. But uh, this is a, a quote that came from a really interesting um, interview this week on CBC. Uh, I can't think it aired on Metro Morning on Monday or Tuesday uh, from Jesse Wente, which was a, a very powerful interview. I encourage you to go back and listen to. Um, and I know that the events of this week and last week have been, you know, have raised a lot of questions, that there's lots of interesting conversations going on. But one of the things that Jesse Wente said to those of us who form, I think, the majority of this audience, which is uh, non-Indigenous peoples, is that we can have all our land acknowledgements that we like. We can talk about how we're committed to the TRC calls to action. But at some point, we have to show the resolve of our solidarity. We have to dare to speak up. We have to dare to be allies. We have to dare to say that the inherent and treaty rights of Indigenous peoples have to be recognized. This country will not go forward in a healthy and wholesome way until we acknowledge those rights and put all our resolve behind making sure that they are implemented. And so I thank you for the opportunity to share some of these thoughts, and I look forward to continuing to walk this journey with you. Yahweh, miigwech. Thank you so much for those uh, really powerful and inspiring comments and really a call to action. Um, and I certainly want to underscore that idea of that kind of accepting ill health among some of us affects the well-being of, its all, of us all. I think that's a really important message for us to take away from this. Um, so I'd like to uh, introduce our, our panel here um, and <clears throat> I'd like to start with uh, Jean Becker, who's uh, the uh, who will moderate tonight's discussion. Uh, Jean is uh, the director, senior director of Indigenous Initiatives at the University of Waterloo. Um, she is uh, Inuk and a member of the uh, Nunatsiavut. I don't know if I got that right. Um, territory of Labrador. A grandmother, Jean has lived in Ontario for 40 years and has been involved in grassroots urban Indigenous community building throughout that time in the Wellington and Waterloo region. Jean is currently a member of the Mayor's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force in Kitchener and a member of the Wellbeing Waterloo Region First Nations, Métis, and Inuit Advisory and Advocacy Circle. Actively involved in Indigenous ceremonies and advocacy work for Indigenous people outside the Academy locally and nationally, Jean is passionate about her work to implement decolonization uh, in the Academy. So welcome, Jean. Uh, Lori uh, Campbell is a two-spirited Cree Métis with family roots at Montreal Lake First Nation, Treaty 6 territory in northern Saskatchewan. She is an intergenerational survivor of the Indian residential school system and a child from the 60s scoop generation. And over this period of 25 years, she has managed to locate and contact not only her birth mom, but all six of her living siblings who are scattered across several provinces. She has made her career advocating for social justice and working towards a more equitable society for all. Started out her career working with at-risk youth, later in the area of indigenous public housing, and then became a victim services resource officer before moving into post-secondary education. Most recently, she was, as many of you know, she was a federal candidate in the 2019 election. Lori is an experienced leader in education with a proven track record, particularly in advancing processes of indigenization, reconciliation, and decolonization. Lori holds degrees in indigenous studies and psychology, and a master's degree in adult education, and is now currently working, I don't know how you do all this, <laughs> a PhD in social justice. And she currently holds uh, the position of director of the Waterloo uh, Indigenous Student Center, and oversees the indigenous studies academic program at St. Paul's University College. So welcome, Lori. Rona Hanning is a professor in the School of Public Health and Health Systems, Associate Dean of Graduate Studies in the Faculty of Applied Health Sciences at the University of Waterloo. 
Her research program emphasizes healthy eating in youth, and she has developed and evaluated approaches to dietary assessment and applied them in school-based uh, programs as part of a mixed methods evaluation of public community health programs and policy interventions. Lona has had the privilege of working with and learning from First Nation communities over the past three decades. This collaborative research on foods, nutrition, and health spans Ontario, BC, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba communities. She lives in Puslinch, Ontario with her husband, two children, and assorted animals, from what I understand. <laughs> Anyway, so welcome to our panelists. And so, Jean, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for a really um, inspiring talk. I, um, you know, it touched me in so many ways, beginning with, with um, you know, when you talked about Sandy Lake. There's somebody here tonight from Sandy Lake, and a former student, and and a, an employee of Waterloo, actually, a student center, and um, you know the picture of the little boy from Maine. So it was so clear that you really know who we are, and that you've taken that time to to really learn what the actual history, but also to learn who we are today. And I, I just want to say thank you so much for that. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm just going to um, turn it over to the uh, fellow panelists and give them an opportunity to comment and, and um, share some of their thoughts and perhaps generate a few questions from everybody out there. So I'll begin. I'll, we'll just go in a line here. I'll begin and hand the microphone over to Lori. Thank you so much, Lori. All right. Um, first of all, just thank you so much for sharing um, what you shared with us this evening and for, again, for all the work that uh, you have done and will continue to do um, in this area. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, there's just so many, so many things in there and, and, and there's, you know, so much going on across Canada right now and, I mean, a bunch of different things jumped out at me, but uh, one in particular, you know, when you're speaking about the Indian health policy in 79 and how the Indian Brotherhood received a fax, and I can only imagine, I'm thinking of the people that were at the table at that time, and, and how that, you know, what that room uh, uh, sort of erupted into on receiving that fax, but um, it kind of, for me, also brings a bit of a parallel to uh, where I see, you know, actions of the current government still kind of sending that fax and coming down on uh, sort of the final say without really doing the consultation that they need. and. You, you know, spoke a lot about RCAP, and I, and I spoke about it today in a, in a class lecture, and, and, I, and I'm teaching this term as well, and most people um, really don't know about that, and I think of my auntie, who's 81 years old, who um, 50 years ago was uh, brought to Parliament to uh, share the issues that were occurring in Indigenous communities, and she went and she consulted with our people, and wrote it down on the one page uh, amount that she was uh, allowed and went there and shared it um, wholeheartedly to ask for help. And the media the next day reported that a beautiful young native girl said there were, there were a lot of issues in indigenous communities. And, and uh, three years ago, I listened to her speak at the University of Toronto in a room much like this. And uh, she said it's the same questions that she's getting asked. And um, the only difference is, is that she um, gets paid more money for it, or she gets paid money for it now, and she takes it back to our communities so that we can heal and learn our culture and, and do well. And it strikes me, you know, with the RCAP and then with the TRC, there's not really a whole lot of new things that came out of the TRC or the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry that we didn't already see in the RCAP. One thing, I do have a question, though, in all of this. One thing I have been thinking a lot about, though, is there young people and 
how their mental health is being affected and how many students we're losing um, across this country today this term because they're out there on the front lines um, fighting for indigenous rights. And I think about the health impact that that's having on their mental health um, when they should be able to be focusing on their studies or their jobs or the other things that they're doing. And, and, uh, and I'm concerned about that and, and, and as it goes on and, and um, you know, how we kind of rectify that because we need our students in the school and, and um, you know, we need, we need our land protectors as well, but I'm just curious about like the impacts of like where, how you think that is playing out for Indigenous people and for our young people. I don't know if you want to comment on that or if you, if you want to. Uh, you're on I, mic. I'm, I'm mic. So I'll just make a brief comment because I want to hear what every, uh, hear from everyone, but uh, I think it's a, a great question and a real challenge, but here we are in a room of people that have a lot of influence over educational institutions. And we need to get the message out that our educational institutions need to adapt to the needs of these young people rather than the young people adapting to the rules of the educational institutions. And I think we're starting to see some signs of that. I mean, the fact that you are in the position that you've got a great student center. Um, I realized I went through my entire talk and I didn't say anything about Queens, my future boss. So I should talk about the fact that they also have a great Indigenous <laughs> Student Center. Um, and, uh, but that they also are, I think we all need to, to find other ways of recognizing the work of these young people. Um, you know, there's a big movement in uh, medical education and probably to a certain extent in all health professions education around competency-based accreditation. I think we could do some really creative work around accrediting this kind of creative work that Indigenous youth are doing around rebuilding their nations, uh, rebuilding their societies, um, taking action for their own health. and. You know, as I say, I think I think all of us together that, and I now count myself among those who will have a role to play in looking at what, how we recognize learning. That we need to change the way that we recognize learning, and uh, and and be bold. So maybe my fellow dean and I can both find some bolder ways to say that uh, these young people know things that their peers who sit in classrooms. Uh, don't know, and we need to acknowledge that and find ways that they can share that better. We just had a fourth year student write, if I was her professor, she totally would have got graded on that at the rally here for Wet'suwet'en a while ago. She gave a 20 minute public lecture uh, at a rally here on campus and then just also published an article in the paper. And, and I think that's just exactly right, is they need to be getting grades for that because they're doing that over and above and it was totally academic and had all the points on mark in it. Thank you. Yes, this is a good, oh, you can hear, okay. Um, great, thank you. So, Jane, uh, thank you so much for an absolutely phenomenal talk. Um, okay, can't hear. <laughs> okay, great. Perhaps you could figure out how to have that work a little better. Okay, so no, I just, just starting to, you know, thank Minister, Dr. Jane, Dean, Director, <laughs> Jane Philpott for just a, a phenomenal talk. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you to Ava and, and Lily for, for welcoming us here and for opening our time together in such, in such a good way. Thank you. Um, I think, like a lot of us, of course, I've been following this situation with Tuetsuitin out west very closely over the last now many weeks. And, uh, and um, one of the areas that I work in, we have, uh, we work with the community in um, Skidigat, Hazelton, BC. Um, and one of the community advisors who's involved in, in our project um, is Wet'suwet'en, and I had reached out to her, and she made the comment back that sometimes out of conflict, there can become 
great transformation mm -hmm. and the quote awakening as she called it that she hoped that that would 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 lead to forming more respectful relationships for her people and i thought you've had the opportunity as someone within government and also someone advocating outside of government um, and can probably have you probably have reflections on the situation um, you know beyond what those of us who are following the news can see um, what would you like to see you know going forward or what path do you think you know this could take going forward specifically on the wet sewing issue yeah. <laughs> I'll just prescribe the answer right here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well there's a big question um, so first of all I just wanted to comment on what you your your comment about how good can come out of these real challenges um, I often remember um, some of the lines that Nelson Mandela wrote um, when he reflected on his time in prison, et cetera, um, and talked about, you know, how he was kind of the compilation of thousands of people who had gone before him, people whose lives will never be recounted or repaid, um, but that somehow, you know, it took such um, heights of oppression and to, to uh, build such heights of character. And that, I've kind of messed up that quote, but it's a really, really good one in the, in the closing pages of A Long Walk to Freedom. Um, but you're absolutely right that there, you know, through this years of, of, of oppression will come the, the carving of, and it already has come, uh, the carving of, of uh, wisdom and character that needs to be recognized in all of this. The, the amazing thing, as I'm sure you know, around Wet'suwet'en is that it's only kind of come to the public's attention in the last couple of weeks, but those hereditary chiefs have been on this for years, um, and nobody's been paying attention. So it's like many, many other issues that Indigenous peoples have been writing about, testifying about at committees and parliament, and until the train tracks get blocked, nobody actually listens, right? So, uh, you know, I think that I don't want to make a political comment specifically, but I have a lot of time for those hereditary chiefs. I, I know that there are challenges around the whole elected leadership and hereditary leadership, uh, but those people are fighting for unceded territory, and they deserve to be listened to by the highest authorities in the land. and. There is a way, like the Royal Commission said, to learn to share land resources, power, and dreams. But it won't happen through unilateral faxes being sent to say, this is how we're going to do it, folks, um, and line up and do what we, what we have decided. Uh, so I think there needs to be a heck of a lot more sitting down and listening, true nation to nation conversations that sounded great in theory but have to now actually be great in practice so. thank you testing <laughs> So thank you both for, for those comments. And um, I, I think, is it OK if we let people ask some questions? And You're the boss. Minister, the doctor, boss. what? <laughs> uh, Minister Philip, uh, thank you very much for the talk. And just I wanted to say you're a personal hero of mine. Um, and the, the point that you made about access to land being at the base of all of this, I thought was very wise and striking, but it also caused me some amount of despair because I, I have a hard time imagining it. Um, and I wondered if from your seat in, or from your experience in government, if you can envision or describe a vision of how that will happen uh, in this country. Because I, 
all I all I know about um, the land claims that are ongoing is that there doesn't seem to have been progress in my lifetime uh, on most of the ones that I'm familiar with. I, the one I'm most familiar with is um, the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte uh, and the town of Deseronto and the Cuthbertson land track and, and all of that. Um, so I just wondered what, what that way forward is. Uh, thank you for the question and the comment. And, and again, there are people here who are probably experts on, on land uh, settlement negotiations, so I'm always cautious when I make comments on an area that is not my expertise. I think that's why uh, the kinds of ac actions that have taken place in the last two or three weeks are really important. Um, is because there still aren't enough Canadians that actually understand what it, what the, the realities of our country, that understand what uh, colonization did, and the fact that Canadians are talking about it, talking about what it means to be on unceded territory, talking about who actually gets to decide where pipelines go, uh, is a really good conversation, and it allows a huge number of allies to to speak up and to say we need to listen to to, peop to the rights of indigenous peoples. So you're right; there aren't a ton of examples. The examples that are uh, there are positive ones, and there are scattered places across the country where people have been able to um, have additions to reserve, which is only a portion of 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 land right recognition. There are, is an accumulating body of court decisions that almost always end up siding uh, with Indigenous peoples in terms of recognizing their inherent rights to land. Um, but it's going to take, the, I think, a lot of the rest of us saying, my gosh, how on earth have we let this happen for so long? And uh, and I'm hearing people saying that in the last uh, in the last few weeks. I'm not sure what you're hearing, but I am hearing a lot of people saying actually a little inconvenience is really different from um, from having denied the rights of entire groups of people who have suffered uh, for as as long as this country has been born. So uh, I don't think that answers your question very well, but I think that we maybe on the cusp of change, but that's the optimist in me. Do you have, do, what do you think? Well, um, you know, I've traveled a bit around the country, and um, in my observation, there's a lot of land here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I went to Europe a few years ago. I went to Germany. And um, I was teaching a class at the time. And, you know, I used to say to my students, you know, some of us actually think that, um, some of us actually think, us being indigenous people, actually think that y'all should go back where you came from. <laughs> because, you know, I wanted to have conversations with them that were straight about how some of us really are quite annoyed. <laughs> anyway, I went to Germany on this trip, and when I came back, I said, hey, they said they could take you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they're really good at packing people in. So <laughs> <laughs> then I had this idea about a country where we have these cities, you know, like really big cities like Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, whatever, and they're kind of labeled reservations. <laughs> and then the rest of the land is all indigenous land. <laughs> I'm joking, but I just want to say, <laughs> you know, it sounds like a monumental problem. I actually don't think it's a monumental problem. How many people did you say we are? A million and? 1.7 million. 1.7 million. Still not 2 million. In this vast country, land is there. 
I know when I was at a previous institution, the Board of Governors in my first visit with them asked me if I could have anything I wanted. I said, land. <laughs> they said, how much? I said, well, 50 acres would be good for a start. And this was solely for educational purposes. Nobody has given me 50 acres yet. <laughs> it's very little, you know? Like, I'm sure there are many 50 acres around and about that it wouldn't be difficult to actually create that kind of space for indigenous education at the University of Waterloo. <laughs> So any more questions? Thank you for your presentation this evening, Jane. That was wonderful. And I always expect physicians to be eloquent. So uh, I really appreciated some of the repetition of the shocking statistics about healthcare for people. Um, I work at the Community Health Centre here in St. Jacob's and we have Mennonite people within our community who have similarly appalling health and um, maternal and child outcomes from similar uh, uh, effects from being apart within the community. So mm -hmm. I certainly appreciate seeing some of those statistics as well. I do have one uh, point, however, uh, to discuss with you, especially as you're going to Queen's, which has a wonderful medical school. Um, but I would argue that the healthcare system as it exists today in Canada is a very patriarchal, medically orientated system. And one of the lessons I feel I've been learning from my indigenous colleagues is about how spirituality and psychological health and the importance of, as you very eloquently pointed out, one's land, one's heritage is in your health. It is not simply an absence of disease. So one of the things I know, and Laurie is sitting right here next to me, um, we have been doing within the Waterloo region is focusing on well-being as uh, uh, an invitation to a different definition of what is health. So I'd certainly be encouraging of you to encourage Queen's to include that in their uh, education system with uh, new healthcare providers. Uh, sadly, I do not feel that social determinants of health are yet uh, ingrained in people's education and understanding in the way that I see healthcare, but I certainly am inspired by the team that I work with that people try to do that. So I'd certainly be uh, very interested if you have any comments about how you see the healthcare system developing in the next few years and the challenge for Canada to actually improve our position on the international stage uh, in terms of our uh, uh, appreciation and improvement of health. Well, thank you for the question. And I do think that you're absolutely right. The, uh, the learning that can take place uh, by understanding traditional knowledge, indigenous ways of knowing, doing, being, uh, will make an impact on our health systems uh, in a significant way. It was really interesting, this, this um, Chief's Council on Health uh, Transformation that I was at two days ago, um, there was a presentation about sort of feedback on what the progress had been so, so far. Uh, and there were two elders who spoke up in the room who said, there, you have not emphasized uniquely the importance of spirituality, was what the first elder said, that spirituality is a key determinant of health for us. Um, and the second elder spoke up and said, you need to uniquely talk about the role of language uh, as a determinant of health, and that until our people relearn and reclaim their language, we will not be healthy. So. I think what it's going to take, though, is, and this is my, my bit of shout out while all these powerful people from the University of Waterloo are in the room, is that um, we have to go out of our way to um, make sure that there are more than you know, three people on this panel up here who are contributing. You, know, the, you saw the, heard the list of all the things Lori's doing, four things she can't divide herself in more ways at once. And what happens often in universities is that the indigenous faculty or, or students are so overwhelmed with trying to educate everybody and sort of be able to provide reference and understanding for everybody. 
I think we need to really go out of our way to uh, find pathways, as we talked about earlier, to bring a far greater number of students and faculty and elders into our educational institutions in order that, that the whole health system, education system is transformed. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention, uh, the recommendations of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, I mentioned it to the students this afternoon, I'm currently obsessed with this recommendation, um, <laughs> is that the, this, in 1996, RCAP, the Royal Commission, uh, recommended that government support the training of 10,000 health professionals in the next 10 years. And that, like all the other recommendations, got put on a shelf. Nobody did anything about it. As far as anybody in Ottawa was ever able to tell me, nothing ever happened with that recommendation. So I'm on a, is, it a, is a vendetta a good thing, can you say? <laughs> or what would be a better word for that? Yes. OK, I'm on a vendetta. <laughs> if you, mission, OK, that sounds kind of. Crusade. Well, that doesn't, crusade's not a good word either. <laughs> okay. Crusade. We're on a path, and we are going to, I think all the, the colleges and universities of this country have to get together and determine that we are going to make sure, and Waterloo will, will be a part of this, um, training health professionals, including the kind of public health experts and health evaluation experts that you're training here and health managers um, to, to, to go to Sandy Lake to these young people and say, which of you wants to be a doctor or a nurse and how are we going to find a path for you to get that education because we need you. We need you not just for your community, we need you for our country. So let's do that together. Yes, I think there's a question up here. Before we get to that next question, um, I, I also wanted just to make note, and you know, I think there's a uniqueness, obviously, of Indigenous peoples, which is why you're speaking here in that uh, colonization is a determinant of health that does situate us differently from any other sort of settler groups that uh, arrive here and have other health disparities. I also was thinking back to, you know, where you said we can't be healthy until we know who we are. And we know that as Indigenous peoples from our elders. We've, our elders here have been reinforcing that for our students, and, and my elders and, and my relations have been doing that as well. And I think, I think, I feel like maybe like mainstream doesn't quite understand it in the same way when, you, when we say we will be healthy when we know who we are in our culture. But that's not like learning about ourselves in books. And I think that is tied back to the land, right? We will. We don't just want to like learn about us. We need to live who we are in our culture. And that does require the land and the spaces to do that on campus and outside of campuses. And I think that that seems different than when I think about it in my Western mind of understanding, you know, culture is, is different. Yeah. That's a good point. My question is, uh, why is diabetes so prevalent in Northern Ontario Indigenous yeah. communities? And why is tuberculosis so prevalent in Inuit communities? And what needs to be done to reduce the, these numbers and these situations? Thank you. Those are good questions that <laughs> probably, you know, people write entire theses on these things. But um, I'll give you the short version that I know, and I, there may be other experts who could tell you more. But diabetes, um, interestingly, Many First Nations have high incidence of diabetes. Inuit do not have a higher than average incidence of diabetes. So it, we, they, we have to always have what, what they, people like to call a distinctions-based approach to these things and not generalize. But um, there, it has, it's multifactorial. You've got a whole bunch of nutrition experts here in the room uh, who can tell you, talk to you about the nutrition, nutritional reasons why diabetes is so... Um, so prominent in terms of the change in diet that has taken place through colonization uh, for people who didn't drink carbonated high sugar soft drinks and eat all the crappy food that gets sent up north on on uh, to the the northern stores to be sold. Um, people historically ate off the land um, and. Uh, th so there's a lot of it has to do with diet. There's a whole bunch of genetic uh, 
uh, causes as well. That, and actually, a lot is not really particularly well understood um, for a bunch of reasons as to exactly why it, within some First Nations it, the incidence is higher than within others. Um, but uh, those would be some of uh, genetics, uh, history, change of diet, lack of access to healthy uh, non-processed food is uh, are, are some of the big issues. As I say, I'm feeling really nervous because I know there's like nu these nutrition experts in the room and <laughs> tell me a lot more. Tuberculosis, um, again, multifactorial. If I could change one thing that would actually change the rates of tuberculosis amongst uh, Inuit, it would be housing. The first thing you need to change is housing. Um, there are people, in, not just in Inuit communities, but in, in uh, many First Nations communities, there are places where you'll see 20 to 25 people living in a two-bedroom house. This is happening not infrequently. Uh, and tuberculosis is one of those uh, uh, infections that long periods of exposure over time dramatically increases your risks of, of acquiring uh, the infection. A lot of it is just neglect that uh, Canada has never paid attention. We have never until the last couple of years had a tuberculosis elimina elimination strategy. Um, can I just tell you the story of Gussie? Can I tell them? OK. There are so many beautiful stories of individual people. But there, this, are you from Maine? North, West Northwest River. Okay, where Jean is from is like the most beautiful place in the country. Nunatsiavut, oh my gosh, if you ever get a chance to go visit uh, Nunatsiavut territory, it is stunning. Anyway, there, the, one of the pictures that I showed you was this boy, 14-year-old Gussie, who died of tuberculosis about two years ago, I think. Um, and when he died, there was no, Nain is not a small community. There was no x-ray machine. There was no public health nurse in the community. Uh, and they had a, suddenly an outbreak of tuberculosis and many, many cases. And until this boy died, nobody was paying any attention to them. Thankfully, we had just, I had just a short time before that, uh, announced with the head of the Inuit Superior Kanatami that Canada is going to work with uh, Inuit governments on a tuberculosis elimination strategy. So as soon as Gussie died, uh, the chief called me, not the chief, the um, president of the Nazi government called me and said, can we get an x-ray machine to Nain? I was able to say, yes, of course, we'll get it there as quickly as we can. Can we get a public health nurse? I said, yes. Can we get these new fancy testing systems that um, can test tuberculosis better than we've been able to in the past? And can we actually get a new short course therapy that can be given to people who have latent tuberculosis? Um, we were, had just gotten ourselves into a position that we could say yes to all of those things. They screened the entire community, found 25 cases of active tuberculosis that nobody knew about, and no other person in that community died. Uh, but if all of that background hadn't been there, these outbreaks happen, and Canada doesn't really know or sometimes seems like they didn't care. So those are some of the perhaps overly simplistic explanations. So thank you so much, uh, Jane. I don't know, Dr. Jane Philpott? Just for Jane. Jane, yeah, for, yes. for coming to speak here today. Uh, my question is for the Indigenous women on the panel. I would like to, I think, hear about how you guys envision sovereign indigenous futures? Like, what does that look like? Uh, and how can the rest of us be accomplices in, in that sovereign indigenous futures? Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that's like, it is, it's like a huge, huge question. But I, I do think fundamental to it is land. Um, and sovereignty over land and being able to have our land bases in order to, um, you know, learn and live who we are. And as we can learn and live who we are, and, you know, we have elders in the room who have, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure seen this in, 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 our, in our younger people, when we're able to do that, we get um, healthy and stronger 
and that radiates out into you know the spaces that we get to work in and be able to work together, which you know which many of us do on this campus. Um, I think, and and uh, you know Jane Jane noted it earlier, and and Jesse's quote is up there. It's uh, you know doing all the things that need to be done when we're not in the room, and in this particular space, there's very few of us in the room, and we do have a lot of good accomplices. Um, from students and, and from some staff and faculty across campus. And, uh, you know, we sincerely appreciate that. Um, the other thing I, I think that is uh, ever important, and, and I told the classes today, is about, you know, who they're going out and talking to about what it is that they are learning. You know, the articles that you posted up there, you know, the, the young man that died, the, the four newspaper articles, I mean, that, none of those were new to me. Um, actually, and most of the quotes, I knew that you had just done this because I know all those quotes, uh, you know, all the, all the recent ones, because that is my lived experience of life of what, you know, my every day. The fact that it's new to many people in the room, um, you know, I would say you're probably not reading the right media or following the right people on social media or learning and being um, as accountable for the learning as you probably could be. And in an educational institute, I mean, this is what we do, right? We learn. And, uh, you know, I, I think the labor of that learning um, needs to come off of uh, Indigenous people. There is a lot of um, resources out there and available that people can do the learning based on, you know, what folks like Jesse have written or, or many other Indigenous scholars and, and work and have those conversations and take up um, that solidarity work of educating and knowing who you are and what that means in relation to who the Indigenous peoples are of the land that we're on. As an Indigenous person, I'm Cree from Northern Saskatchewan, and you know, and I was a little terrified coming out here. You know, I'll admit it's a Mohawk country. We heard about those Mohawks out west, and <laughs> you know, it's uh, <laughs> they're a force, right? And so, like, I tread it very lightly, and I still do. Like, even scares the bejesus out of me <laughs> just by being here. But uh, you know, and so, like, knowing who knowing who we are, and and uh, when we know who we are and how we relate to each other and how we come to the table, then we can do good work together, alongside each other. So what, um, so you wanted to know what sovereignty would look like, or what I think it would look like, or it could look like. So one of the things that struck me in your talk, Jane, was um, Edmund. Mm. With the beautiful house in, uh, was it Sioux Lookout? Uh, no, Fort Albany. Fort Albany, up in Fort Albany. Here he has his most beautiful house of any house up there. And um, I spent a lot of time on quite a few reserves. And I have observed some astonishing. Um, astonishing <laughs> incompetence in terms of the housing that is being provided by the federal government on reserves. So I'll tell you a real quick story. I have a friend, I have friends. There's actually about 12 of them because it's family, mom, dad, and Ten kids. So for um, many years, they've lived with her parents in a three-bedroom house, raising ten children. And they're on the banned wait list for, I think, well, long enough to have ten kids anyway. <laughs> However long that took them, which wasn't that long. Anyway, <laughs> they, they had to finally get, get a house on the reserve. We go out there in the summer, we're all excited, brand new house, cool. And I wanted to go visit, and she kept putting me off. She didn't want me to come visit. And I was like puzzled. I thought she'd be all thrilled about showing me her brand new house. Well. <laughs> She had to let my husband in because her husband wanted to my husband to come and fix something because he's a real good fixer. So 
he went in the house. And then when afterwards he said to me, I couldn't believe it. There's no paint in any of the rooms. The floors are plywood. So she was embarrassed. Well, even worse, do you know, a year later, when I went back the following summer, they had moved out of that house back to her mother because the house was condemned because it was falling apart and it was moldy. What that tells you is there's a problem with the Indian Act. <laughs> and quite frankly, so one of the grandmothers on that reserve used to say to us all the time, I don't, why don't these children go out and do what we did? Build a house like Edmund. Because that's what in her generation people did. They went and built their own houses. They have all the trees they need to do the log house. You can't go just building houses on a reserve, you know. I mean, Ava could tell you all about that. So sovereignty <laughs> would be actually having the ability to govern yourself. Here, here. And if we had that ability, everything would change. Yeah. And this is, this is one of the reasons why I really admire, you know, what the Anishinaabe Aski Nation is doing and how they are taking, taking some control over and, and this whole notion of health transformation being driven by the communities. This is what sovereignty is going to look like. Good job. Did you, did you? Yes, I had two questions. First question had to do with uh, Dr. Philpott. Uh, we, I really appreciated your presentation and the insights that you offered. My question was, I didn't understand what you said when you said that the indigenous people need our land to heal. What do you mean by that is the one question. And the second question I had is, is there an impediment in allowing the Indian Act to simply evaporate and allowing indigenous peoples to be able to do what they're doing with the health transformation in some communities, be able to take control of their own lives. Thank you. I, um, I think our time is running out, so I'll try to answer fairly quickly. But in terms of the land healing, my colleagues would be probably better able to explain what that means. And it's, it's a bit of a hard concept to explain. but. I think, I'm sure you, some of you have had a chance to walk in the forest, to get out on the water in a canoe, and had a sense, even if you're not indigenous, we know that nature has healing power. We know that, you know, the, people talk about nature deficit disorder, and there is something extremely powerful that happens uh, just by getting out on the land. But particularly if your entire uh, history and culture is tied to your relationship with the land, to understanding you know, how, the, how the wind moves, what the creatures of the forest are, can tell you, um, what you can learn by growth patterns. Um, and this is handed down through generations, through elders uh, and teachers that can tell you the healing power of some of the, the plants and herbs that are available. Um, 
as I say, I'm, I'm not being very articulate in explaining this, but it is a concept that you will hear over and over and over again uh, from Indigenous peoples. Because they grew up on the land, because that is the roots of, their, of, of who they are, um, when we took that away and forced them to live in not only postage stamp sized pieces of land, but in these crappy little falling apart uh, boxes that we call houses, um, and then snatch them out of those communities and put them in residential schools where they really lost touch with that culture, um, that has had extraordinary consequences. And so some of the healing that has to take place means not only getting back uh, to your communities and learning your language, but actually literally learning that on the land. And it's a phenomenon that I think the rest of the country could learn a lot from what on the land healing looks like. The second question I'll answer uh, very quickly, and it was around, now I have to remember what, oh, the Indian Act. So a, a certain prime minister named Trudeau, whose first name was Pierre, <laughs> wrote something called the White Paper in 1969 um, and proposed, you know, just like pulling, just disbanding the Indian Act and just like pretending nothing ever happened. It was probably one of the worst moments of his entire uh, prime ministerial history. It caused massive uh, anxiety, <laughs> to put it mildly, amongst Indigenous peoples. Nobody thinks the Indian Act should continue in perpetuity. Everyone believes it needs to be dismantled. But the problem is that so much of the rules of how everybody's living uh, exists within the Indian Act that communities need to actually do this work that Jean talked about of rebuilding themselves, about of reclaiming their sovereignty, reclaiming their um, their rights, including self-government, to sort of say, if we're not going to be governed by the Indian Act, this is, this is how we are going to be governed. This is our self-determined form of government uh, that will replace it. And that has, that's happened in a number of places. I think 22 or 25 First Nations in the country now are self-governing and thriving. Um, but until communities sort of do that work of rebuilding their nations and rebuilding their governments, we can't actually completely dismantle it. There are some short-term pathways to get there and ways that communities can, for instance, pull out of all of the land uh, laws, that are, which is about a third of the Indian Act, has to do with the rules of how the land is managed, um, that there are ways to, to get rid of that part of it. But um, it's unfortunately more complicated than then uh, it would at first appear to just pass a law to say it no longer exists would cause chaos. There's a lot here, obviously, to continue talking about. Um, but I think for tonight, we'll, we'll draw this to a close. And please join me in thanking uh, our panelists. And thank you again, uh, Jane, for your uh, really important and inspiring comments and your, your call to action. Uh, I think that was very meaningful. Um, so we have some gifts uh, for you here um, as to the panelists. Are these? Yes. Aww. I'll let you distribute them. <laughs> And thank to all, thank thank you uh, to all of you to uh, come out tonight on on what is uh, oh, a bit of a pretty. an unpleasant night. Name. I'm told that the roads are starting to get a little bit dicey, so please uh, be careful on your way home. Uh, but don't run away right away because we do have some refreshments out there and so forth. So please avail yourself of some of those. Uh, uh, as you go. So anyway, thank you again to all of you and thank you again uh, to our presenters and panelists.